We're happy to have Amri Ben Eliezer presenting at our ANC seminar today. Uh, Amri is currently a postdoctoral fellow in the theory group at Harvard. Uh, his area of study focuses on algorithms for large scale structured data, uh, especially sublinear time and streaming algorithms, adversarially robust algorithms, and learning based algorithms. Uh, today, he'll be talking about adversarially robust streaming algorithms. And here's Amri. Thank, thank you so much, Juan Kun, for the introduction. Um, so uh, this talk will be based on uh, several joint works with uh, um, Noga Alon, Yuval Dagan, Rajesh Jaram, Shai Moan, Moni Nal, David Woodruff, and Elon Yugev. And I guess most or, or all of you know about uh, the streaming model of computation, which is very useful for analyzing uh, extremely large data sets. So for example, uh, in internet traffic or uh, sensor data or algorithms for databases, uh, the streaming uh, model of computation is very useful. And usually in streaming, we care about algorithms that have small space, but in sometimes uh, we want algorithms that uh, have good runtime or a good uh, sample complexity. And in this talk, I will discuss tracking algorithm, a special case of uh, streaming algorithms, where we basically, um, uh, the, the, the stream is, we, we see the stream elements one by one as usual, but we also output, uh, uh, we also provide outputs one by one as we receive elements. So fix some function f, which is the function that we want to compute or in this talk uh, approximate because usually in streaming uh, uh, exact computation is difficult. So fix this function f and fix some error parameter epsilon uh, for the approximation. And we now uh, see elements one by one. So we see the element x1 and then the element x2 and so on. And after each element that we see, we need to output some value rt that uh, is required to be with high probability a good approximation of the function that we need to approximate uh, on the inputs up to time t. So this is a tracking algorithm. So let's try to uh, visualize this. Um, at time t, uh, the stream uh, provides us with an element xt. And then uh, the algorithm uh, needs to provide an output, which is an approximation of the function on the stream. And then another element is sent from the stream and we provide another output. And Okay, and, 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 and in classically in, in the streaming literature, it is assumed that the data that uh, appearing in the stream is fixed before the algorithm starts. So you won't see it uh, explicitly mentioned in, 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 in streaming papers, but it is an implicit uh, assumption. Uh, sometimes it, it's not even realized by, by the authors, I don't know. But, but, it's, it's, an, it's an implicit assumption that is usually taken in uh, most of the streaming literature. So uh, what I mean by that is that future data that is sent to the algorithm does not depend on the outputs that the algorithm provides. So after we sent, uh, uh, after the stream sent us the uh, element at time t, xt, and we provide an output rt, the next element that the uh, stream will provide us will not depend on the output. And this assumption that um, the, the, the future elements that we receive do not depend on previous outputs may just not be realistic in many situations. So for example, if uh, there's a customer buying uh, items from let's say Amazon. So Amazon offers some, some initial set of, of items uh, uh, to the user and then the user uh, might, cho might choose one of them. And then the next set of items uh, provided to the user depends on the, on the, on the, on the chosen one. And uh, the user ch uh, chooses another and, and buys another item and so on. And so uh, the stream of items that the user buys um, depends on outputs of, our algo of Amazon's algorithm because 
the, the, the items can, can only belong to the list of items that uh, Amazon provides, for example. And the, um, the, this is a, uh, this this is not uh, uh, the, 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 so there are many situations uh, of of this nature in uh, uh, in in many settings. So, for example, in computer networks, if uh, we have a network algorithm, uh, uh, or this, let's say network router that uh, traffics some some um, communi some uh, network communication, um, if we have some in, in, if some attacker that uh, sees uh, um, that sees how the, the router behaves and tries to uh, to run a denial of service attack that depends on how the the router behaves. Um, then the the information that the attacker sends to the router depends on the outputs of the router. And there are many other situations. So for example, in, in an autonomous vehicle interacts with the environment and then and the. Um, in, in medical signals, maybe the the, uh, the way we we treat a, a patient depends on 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 the signal and, and so on, and it's also an, it's also useful in the analysis of classical uh, algorithms. So, for example, in in dynamic graph algorithms, even if the sequence of of updates is fixed in advance, it's sometimes uh, sometimes an analysis that uh, is suitable for. Uh, for, a, for an interactive uh, communication uh, is useful. So assuming that, that uh, the stream is not fixed in advance is in many cases natural and, and required. And um, in this talk, we will consider an adversarial model where there is an adversary that controls, uh, that is adaptive and controls stream updates. So after the adversary, so the output at time t, it gets to choose uh, the next element to send in the stream. And surprisingly, this, this kind of regime, even though it's natural uh, and, and captures many uh, practical situations, um, was, not, was not thoroughly investigated in the streaming literature. So generally, there are no known guarantees for streaming algorithms uh, in this case. And, and as I said, so, so, so sometimes there indeed are streams uh, can be uh, generated by, by an actual adversary and we, we want our algorithms to be uh, protected against this. Okay, so again, the, the adversarial model is as follows. It's modeled by, by two players, the adversary and the algorithm. So first, the adversary sends us some element x1. Then the algorithm provides an output, r1. Now, the adversary uh, receives this output and can choose the next element accordingly. So let's say that the adversary chooses an element x2, and then the algorithm provides an output. And now it sends another element that may depend on the, on the previous outputs and so on. So this is the adversarial model. And we want the algorithm to be robust even against this adaptive adversary. So we want the algorithm to always provide uh, answers that are good approximations to uh, the function f. And OK, so it's a, it's a two-player game. The, the goal of the adversary is, uh, is for this not to happen. So the adversary wants us uh, that for some time t, the output of the algorithm will be will not be a good approximation of the function that we want to compute. And let's, for the sake of sim simplicity, let's assume that the adversary has an unbounded computational power and that it knows the entire history um, of the outputs uh, provided until now in, in the process. The, the assumption that the, the of unboundedness are not are not that essential. I mean, all uh, um, so so the attacks that 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 we know that that work well uh, in many cases don't uh, don't assume uh, unbounded computational power, and the defenses that we know until now, um, so, but the defenses regardless in in many cases work against bounded or unbounded computational power for the adversary. 
And what, what, what we worry about is that the adversary might learn the randomness chosen by the algorithm. So if the adversary knows, uh, we, we, we definitely want to, want to assume that the adversary knows uh, the algorithm that, that we run. But if the adversary knows both the algorithm and the randomness uh, and that the algorithm uses, then it's easy for, for them to, to attack us. So this is what we worry about, an adversary that learns the randomness chosen by the algorithm. Okay, are, are there any questions about the model now? So Omri, a quick question. Uh, you know, the, so the adversary can, the, the algorithm can pick fresh randomness at time step T, which, you know, it can pick fresh randomness at every time step T, right? Uh, so, right. so maybe the adversary knows like all the randomness up to now, but clearly it can't know. Okay, all right. Sorry. Right, and, and, and indeed, it, 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 thanks for the comment. And, and, and indeed, indeed, it seems that algorithms that uh, generate fresh randomness uh, uh, throughout the time are more robust. But this, this is more just a high level statement. Got it, thanks. Uh, but but, but it, indeed, it, it seems to be the case that uh, if you generate fresh randomness, it helps. Um, okay, so. Um, um, so, so this is the adversarial model, and I guess the first question that we can ask uh, about the adversarial model is whether known algorithms uh, for classical uh, streaming for the that, that work under the assumption that the stream is fixed in advance, whether they work in this adversarial model. Okay, so first, deterministic algorithms are inherently adversarially robust. Um, because just because the, the the power of the adversary, I mean, if if uh, an algorithm is deterministic, then the adversary can just simulate the, the algorithm fully uh, without communicating with us, and and the, so so the, the the ability to see our outputs is, is just uh, is just uh, just doesn't matter when the algorithm is deterministic if if the adversary is unbounded. But the problem with deterministic algorithms is that they are just not efficient for many interesting problems. So uh, let's say uh, consider the problem of, comp of computing the second moment of, of a stream. It's, it's, it's a very important and uh, central problem in, in, in the streaming literature. Um, so it, it was shown in a seminal work by Elon, Matthias and Segedi that on the one hand, there is no sublinear space deterministic streaming algorithm for this problem. But if we allow randomness, then, and let's say epsilon is a constant, then just a logarithmic amount of space is enough. So deterministic algorithms are robust against adversaries, but in many cases, they are just not efficient enough for us to seriously, to seriously consider them. Now, on the other hand, randomized algorithms that are many, uh, uh, many types of, of useful randomized algorithms used in, in the streaming literature. But we don't have any guarantee a priori that they will be robust against an adversary. And indeed, there are several families of, of uh, randomized algorithms where there's good evidence that they are not as robust as we would want them to be. So for example, linear sketching, um, a very useful technique in, 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 in many problems. Uh, is not robust. It was shown first by, by Hart and, uh, and David Rudruff in, uh, in, in a turnstile model um, where we allow insertions and deletions. And in fact, uh, we were able to show with, with Rajesh, David, and Elon uh, that the AMS sketch, which is another type of, of linear sketch, um, is, uh, is not robust even for insertion only streams. And, and the reason for, for, both, for, for this too is that in, as, as, as you mentioned, um, um, uh, that the, in, in, in linear sketching, we choose some random me metrics uh, in the beginning. And all that it takes for an adversary to know the randomness is to, 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 learn some, to learn important information about the metrics. And so, so there are some techniques that use streaming to uh, learn this uh, kind of information that allows the adversary to attack. Um, there are also other uh, situations where uh, randomized algorithms may fail. 
So for example, if we use an, a hash that we, without crypto assumptions, so a hash that is not cryptographically secure, then it, it, it might be a problem, of course, because if, if the adversary learns about the hash, then, then we don't really have anything to, to do. So to summarize, deterministic algorithms are robust, but not necessarily efficient. Randomized algorithms are efficient in many cases, but not necessarily robust. And okay, then there are some randomized algorithms where we, it's not clear whether they are robust or not. It might depend on, on, on the parameters. It might, it might depend on the particular setting. So, so it's, it's not clear what algorithms are robust and what aren't. Um, so, so just a quick question uh, to get a sense of what the attack is, right? So, so you're saying if the uh, AMS is a, is a linear function of the frequency spectrum, right? Uh, uh, and you're saying if I can, uh, so is, is the attack the following? If I, can, if I can find a vector in the kernel of the linear mapping, uh, which should exist because the mapping is compressing, uh, then, uh, you know, then I get a, Right, then I get a vector, a frequency vector with large L2 norm, uh, because I can scale it up as much as I want, uh, but it'll map to zero. So, you know, is that yeah. is that the attack essentially? So, uh, so the attack is uh, basically once it learns the structure of the matrix. Um, so, so in some sense, the the, the reason that the these, these random matrix based uh, techniques work is that. Um, with high probability, if you, if you embed a, a, a certain vector with uh, with the random with the random matrix, then the norm will be what we expect it to be. But it's 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 not true for any vector. If you if you take a vector in the, in, in the in the eigenspace, then obviously it's not uh, going to generate what we want. So yeah. so that's that idea. You you learn the matrix, or you learn some important information about uh, about. Um, about its kernel or anything like this, and uh, and then then you use. Uh... Hmm. I see. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so it's not clear whether known algorithms are robust or which of them are robust and which aren't among the efficient algorithms, and. Um, now, okay, so and another question that one may ask is whether whether robust streaming is more difficult in some sense or is harder in, in, in a complexity uh, uh, kind of sense um, than classical streaming. So is there a function that is easy to approximate uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in the classical setting where uh, the stream is fixed in advance, but hard to, uh, um, hard to approximate in the robust setting, where the uh, adversary can can see our outputs and uh, in, in, uh, react in an adaptive manner. Okay, so um, until recently this was an open question, but now we have an answer. So it was shown by by Kaplan, Mansour, uh, Nisim, and, and Stemmer that uh, there exists a streaming problem. It's inspired by the adaptive data analysis literature that requires only a polylog space in the classical setting so we can we can we can consider it efficient but it actually actually requires polynomial space in the adversarial setting so sometimes uh, sometimes uh, uh, adversarial robustness really comes at the cost sometimes you have to no matter the function there exist problems uh, I mean, okay, no matter, no matter the algorithm, there exist functions that are just harder to approximate if you want to, to do that in, a, in an adversarially robust manner. Um, so do you happen to remember if the attack in, the, uh, in this uh, work, in this theorem, is an efficient attack or, or it's an unbounded attack? Uh, so in, in their work, um, yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think it, they, they do have a variant where it's efficient. Efficient, I see, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I, but I have to check and then and get it. Um, okay. Um, so um, in, in this talk, I'll talk about a, a couple of, of directions related to the sorry, robust streaming algorithms that we investigated. The first front is uh, related to um, generic techniques 
for turning classical streaming, uh, I mean, algorithms that work in the classical setting into algorithms that work in the robust setting. And I'll present one, um, one simple combinatorial technique. Um, uh, we, we'll see also another one, but I, I won't go into too much detail. And I'll also mention more advanced results based on uh, cryptographic uh, assumptions, um, using differential privacy tools, and using a new type of a new class of streaming algorithms that were developed in some sense uh, inspired by uh, while inspired by by this adversarial robust uh, uh, context. And another form that I will uh, discuss is related to uh, the, robustness of, uh, the robustness of random sampling against an adversary. And again, I, I won't go into too much detail, but I will mention some connections uh, to, to statistics and uh, to online learning and, and what, what, what these kind of results imply in, in high dimensional geometry, for example, as, as, as one example. Okay, so let me start um, with the first part about robustification techniques for uh, static algorithms into robust ones. So, so the main result is, is a generic method to transform uh, many types of streaming algorithms into ones that work in the adversarial robust setting. And this, the space overhead is not large. Okay, so, so one could argue what is small. So it's, it's uh, we will see the results and actually there are, there are also open questions about uh, about the, the space overhead or the runtime overhead that this, that, this, uh, that these methods incur. But the high level picture is that for many problems, we, can, we are able to get um, string algorithms that are robust against uh, adversaries using just a small overhead compared to the classical algorithms. So, okay, sam sampling is kind of uh, one such technique, but uh, the two techniques that uh, uh, we provide in this work with, with uh, Rajesh, uh, David, and Elon are uh, called the uh, sketch switching and uh, uh, computation passes. Um, and uh, and they, they are incomparable. So uh, computation passes is better um, for uh, streaming problems where we know that the algorithms, for algorithms that are have a very good dependence in uh, in the in the error probability, in the, in the probability of the, the algorithm uh, uh, to in, in delta uh, in, in the in, in delta where, where we we want the algorithm to be correct with probability one minus delta. So computation passes is good if, if the dependence in delta is better than logarithmic. Um, and basically, the main idea is that uh, uh, through a careful analysis of of, uh, um, of changes along the stream. Uh, we can we can conclude that uh, running just the same algorithm but with with very uh, small delta is enough um, to to make the algorithm robust. So all that it takes to make the algorithm robust using this technique is just to run it with a very small uh, delta. And the question is what delta is enough for that? Another technique that we will see in a bit more detail is uh, the sketch switching technique, um, which is more. Uh, it keeps multiple copies. We, we'll see. We'll see it soon, and uh, it's more suitable in in, in uh, when uh, uh, when we have algorithms that uh, provide tracking in a more efficient way than the naive one of just having an algorithm that we know is correct at one point, running a union bound over this kind of uh, idea. Okay, but regardless, the key definition for both of these techniques, and actually for uh, for also for many of the subsequent subsequent works in the, in this field is is the definition of a flip number. And for 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 a function the function that we want to compute, uh, we define the flip number of the function to be the maximum number of times over all streams possible. That uh, the value of the function over the stream changes by a lot. So it changes by a factor of one plus epsilon. After let's say n, n, n elements in the stream or poly n doesn't really matter. So for example, let's say, let's again consider the, the F2, uh, the second moment. Um, 
And okay, we think of uh, this function f as a function of the frequencies of the elements. Um, so, so this is basically uh, so. So basically, we think about the the vector of frequencies uh, uh, of elements that we've seen until uh, until now. And let's say that we consider the insertion only model where we uh, only insert elements. So after one step in this model, we have so so the norm of the of the the, the, the norm of the of the relevant vector is equal to one, and after poly n steps, um, the norm squared is again uh, just poly n. Um, and since we consider insertion only uh, streams, the uh, frequencies in the vector just increase with time, they don't decrease. So this function uh, f of x uh, is non decreasing. And the number of changes that we can see are only like, so we can only see like uh, changes of. Uh, uh, increasing by a factor of one plus epsilon. And how many times can this happen? So we started out with with value of one. We ended up with um, value of poly n. So number of changes is is, is log of poly n in in, uh, in base uh, for one plus epsilon, which is of order log n over epsilon. So uh, to summarize, the flip number of this function f two in the insertion only model is log n over epsilon. And the main theorem that, that uh, we uh, were able to prove is that if we have an algorithm A, which provides epsilon tracking for some function, and this algorithm is in the static regime, we don't assume it's adversarially robust. Given such an algorithm, we can construct another algorithm, which is adversarially robust and which tracks the same function f with space complexity uh, with a factor of uh, uh, the, the flip number times the original space of the algorithm and also the, the, the runtime is also in, uh, has the same factor although for some problems we have uh, we we could optimize the, the, the runtime a bit more than that um, so, for example, if we apply uh, this theorem to, to F2, um, so there is an adversarial robust algorithm for epsilon tracking F2 using um, poly uh, 1 over epsilon and log n um, uh, space. And this works in the insertion only model. Um, so, just to understand, so, uh, so any function with uh... With a polynomial sort of range, right? Uh, would you know your argument would work, right? I mean, uh, uh, mm. yeah. I think if 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 uh, if we consider insertion only, right, uh, right. That's right. Yeah, that, that, right. That, that's an important distinction because if you can like increase and decrease uh, uh, the normal vector, uh, like in turnstile model, then it's a problem. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, the second question is: Is is there something better? You can say about the flip number for the L two than sort of uh, one over epsilon log n. Like if you, you know, uh, uh, is this the best bound really. that one can? That's that's a tight bound. It is. I see. Yeah, I mean, okay. So uh, uh, other other comments is uh, that maybe the dependence in in this flip number in in the algorithm is is not optimal, and uh, in, okay. we'll see that the, in, in in some case, in some sense, it's it's indeed the case, but. Um, um, but the flip number, I mean, uh, uh, it's it's indeed in many cases uh, uh, it matches this this uh, bound. Okay, and the high level idea of sketch of sketch switching that uh, I, I'll try to present now is that we present multiple copies, the flip number copies of a classical sketch, a sketch for the classical uh, uh, stream. And we want to carefully reveal information about the sketches. So we don't really, we want to, to, to reveal as few information as possible. And once we, once some new information about some sketch is revealed, we just throw it away. Let's see, what, let's see the implementation details. So, so we run, uh, we run a, a concurrently a flip number many independent sketches of uh, of the of this of the streaming algorithm of the static streaming algorithm, 
And once the estimate of, and each time we have like one active copy that we view its output. And, but, but we don't, we don't view it, its current output. We um, view an output that, some output that, uh, of, of this algorithm that uh, uh, was fixed in the past. And once the current output of the algorithm is sufficiently far away from the, uh, the output of the algorithm that we actually provi provide to the adversary, we we uh, we feel like in like we are in danger. So um, it, it, if if we if we keep using the same output and not changing and and, and don't and, and do not change it with time, then it might be that our algorithm will not be in a one plus epsilon approximation anymore. So once the approximation factor becomes bad enough, we throw away this um, uh, the current sketch, and we use the new sketch. We, we look at the current output of the new sketch. And then this, this is the active sketch until again, um, the output of it is, is, is sufficiently different from uh, the current output that it has. And it, it can be shown that um, this strategy will work uh, since it basically requires, uh, for, 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 uh, for this not to work means that um, we, we, at some point we will run out of sketches but the definition of flip number implies that um, uh, that we will not run out of sketches. Exactly because we designed, the, I mean, we designed the algorithm exactly to, to follow the definition of flip number, which uh, again means that uh, um, that uh, we can we can't see uh, too many uh, changes in in the output uh, a long time. So there are some more uh, intricate details, but this is the high level idea. So. Omri, what is it okay to interrupt? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so so you you start with some sketches one, but in the same time, like you already plan ahead for the future sketches, and you know there might be um, lambda f of these. So you start with your S1, and so as long as it's good, you keep it. And once it's no longer a good sketch, you kind of throw it away and and then you use S2. Yes. And the key idea is that we say that it's no longer a good sketch once um, uh, its output is, 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 is uh, too much different than the output that we actually provide. So we change a sketch once in some sense the output is, it changes by too much. And this is exactly what is captured by the flip number definition. The flip number means that we don't have too, too many changes that are like that are large. So, there, are some, there are some technical details. So the approximation factor of the sketch is should be better than that of, of the flip number, but I mean, it, it, it works out. So maybe one, so why is, this, why is the um, approximation factor of S2 is better than that of S1? It's not better. It's just that we, uh, we uh, it, it might be that the approximation factor of, of S1 is, is, is perfect, but we don't really want to reveal information, too much information about S1 because the way, the way we have it right now, the only time that you see an output of, um, uh, of, of, uh, of an algorithm, um, this output is frozen and you never see any other outputs. So in some sense, you never like, the, the, you can't really like um, affect the internal state of any of the algorithms that you will use in the future because you never saw their outputs. You only see outputs of past algorithms. Thanks. So this is kind of a method to, to, to not say anything at all about any of the sketches. It's uh, it, it's not that like we reveal information carefully and and have some some uh, some uh, some comp complicated bounds about how much information you released. We just don't release any information. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so I didn't quite understand when. How do you decide when to change the sketch? Uh, so is it uh, after some time elapsed you change it or? Yes. So after after uh, the so uh, the the value that uh, the adversary sees is some output of the current sketch that was frozen in the past, and um, what we um, 
And once the actual output of the current sketch is too far away from, from the frozen output, then we have to change because we are afraid that the, the um, because the actual output we will actually take like an epsilon over 10 approximation of, of the of the function. So it's it's a very accurate one. And one once this one is is different, is too much different than the frozen output, then it may be the case that that uh, uh, our whole approximation is, is worse than one plus epsilon. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, so this was an example of one technique, the sketch switching technique, um, and using either the sketch switching technique or the computation pass technique, the, the results are not that different, although the problem optimized in in, in some ways. Um, we are able to get adversarially robust algorithms whose complexity is, in, in most cases, it's it's more than the non-adversarial. Uh, a randomized uh, complexity. So here we talk about the uh, space complexity. So in many cases, it's 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 slightly bigger than the non-adversarial uh, space complexity, but it's much smaller than the deterministic space complexity. So uh, for deterministic algorithms, we usually have a, a linear or near linear lower bounds, or at least polynomial lower bounds. But um, for many interesting problems in streaming, it turns out that you can have adversarial robustness. Uh, without paying polynomial factoring factors in the space. You just need to pay um, a poly log uh, n and uh, poly one over epsilon. Um, and actually, so um, in some cases, uh, the adversarial methods can match uh, the non-adversarial ones. So, so one, one example that we were able to show is that if you take a hashing-based non-adversarial technique, optimal non-adversarial technique, and if you ensure that the, the hash is, is cryptographic, cryptographically secure, so if you, you make some standard cryptographic assumptions, then you can get, uh, and, and the, the adversary is uh, computationally bounded, then uh, you get uh, the optimal bound for non-adversarial uh, randomized algorithms. Okay, and so, some, some uh, follow-up works and, and, and open questions. Um, so uh, in our works, uh, in our work, the, the, the dependence in the flip number was linear and one may ask whether it can be improved. And in fact, uh, uh, it was shown by, by uh, Hasidim, Kaplan, uh, Mansour, Matthias and Stemmer that you can actually improve the, the dependence to square root of the flip number. Um, and uh, in, some, in some cases, I mean, so, sometimes the dependence in the other parameters is worse, but in problems where the flip number is large, in general, this is, a, 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 this is a preferable. And this square, root, uh, uh, this square root dependence in the flip number is essentially tight um, for some problems. So uh, the separation result of uh, static adversaries, of, of static streaming versus adversarial streaming implies that this square root dependence is optimal in some cases. Um, the results we have are mostly for insertion only streams, as we mentioned, and turn style streams seem to, to impose a, a, a big problem and we, we, don't, we, we don't understand them very well. So this is, I think, is, is a central open question right now. What, what to do uh, in the adversarial robust uh, regime uh, for turn style streams? Do can 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 do they have? I mean, poly log space uh, algorithms for popular problems. We don't know that, and we actually are not sure whether the answer is they don't have or uh, or they do or or, or there are some uh, interesting techniques to uh, that work for uh, turn style streams. Um, another question that one may ask is so so there are gaps that look small, but, but in practice, uh, uh, they, they can be uh, highly non-trivial non uh, between um, non-adversarial uh, randomized algorithms and our techniques. Um, because we, we have, for example, a worse, depend, worse polynomial dependence in epsilon, which can actually hurt in practice. And the question is whether we can, without crypto, we can get uh, uh, better non-adversarial upper bounds 
uh, we, we can get better adversarial, adversarial bust upper bounds? And the answer is yes, there are uh, a, a new, uh, a new type of streaming algorithms called difference estimators by, by David and by Samson Zhu um, that uh, work well in the robust regime uh, for some of the problems we mentioned. And actually, okay, so the, the, the other follow-up question is whether we, what, what can you do with crypto assumptions? Um, and finally, so um, these, uh, all of these, uh, so, so the, uh, setting that we consider until now is one where you have, so essentially the setting for the flip number is one where you have a single uh, a single output that is, let's say a real number. But in, in many problems, for example, graph problems or clustering or many other problems, you, you mostly care about a larger output, uh, let's say a vector output. And we don't have a, a standard uh, generic techniques for, for this kind of settings. Okay, so this was the first part of the talk about generic techniques uh, to turn uh, streaming algorithm, algorithms uh, into robust ones. In the second part, um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a few more uh, details into uh, a specific line of work on uh, the robustness of sampling against adaptive adversaries. And along the way, we will see some interesting connections to, um, to other areas. So um, we want to address the following question. How many uniform samples from, from some data are required for the sample to be representative of the data? And th this, is, uh, this uh, is called by, by statisticians a law of large numbers. And laws of large numbers uh, guarantee that a, a large enough sample from uh, from some data from some distribution in, in their case um, converges to the same structure as the data and let's let's consider some canonical some canonical example uh, of a, a median uh, of a stream of uh, real numbers and the question is how many uniform samples uh, are needed so that, the, so that the median of the sample will be close enough, will be an epsilon approximation of the median of the stream. So let's say that we are given this uh, stream and, and we sort it. So, so this, uh, uh, this is uh, the area that we consider the, the epsilon uh, approximation of the median. This is the actual median. And the question is, if you take a sample of so-and-so elements, what is the probability that uh, the median of the sample will be a good approximation of the median of the stream? And the motivation for, uh, in fact, so um, uh, there are very efficient uh, uh, streaming algorithms for uh, computing the median that are deterministic, but here we are mostly interested in, this, in the sample complexity and not the space complexity. And the question is how many samples do, do you need? Uh, uh, to, pre to preserve uh, uh, the median, for example, in a robust manner. Okay, so, so here's an analysis. I would like to argue that um, if you want a success probability one minus delta and you want an epsilon approximation, then uh, order of magnitude of log one over delta over epsilon squared samples are good enough for the median of the sample to capture the median of the stream. Okay, so here's a proof. Um, we, um, we sort the elements, we uh, apply a churn of bounds. So uh, we apply it uh, once to uh, guarantee that not too many elements from the sample appear in uh, this part. So we're taken from this part. And we apply it another time to, to make sure that not too many elements from uh, in the sample were taken from this part. So we apply churn of bound twice. And it turns out that if uh, these two conditions are okay, then, um, then the, the, the median of the sample will indeed be an approximation of the median of the stream. Okay, so let's try to revisit the proof. We wait for the elements to arrive, we sort them, we apply churn of bound, and then, okay, and then we're all good. But does this proof always work? So, 
Okay. The, the question, the, the, the answer. So the, the answer is obviously no. If 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 I ask this uh, question, and well, the, the proof implicitly assumes that all elements were chosen in advance because we wait for all elements to arrive. We somehow uh, uh, assume some independence between the elements. So a rule of thumb that is that if you uh, if uh, your analysis uses churn of bound uh, at some point, and if you weren't very very careful. It's probably not suitable for um, for an, for analysis against an adaptive adversary. So indeed, this proof works in the static case. It doesn't work in the adversarial case. And okay, so so the adversarial model for sampling would be as follows. Um, um, so uh, let's say so in each round, an adversary sends an element to the sampler, and then. The sampler, instead of saying uh, the output of some algorithm, let's say that, uh, although it doesn't really matter, but let's say that the sampler uh, tells the adversary whether the element was sampled or not sampled. And then uh, the adversary can send another element and is again told whether this element was sampled or not, and so on. So this is the, this is the model for uh, uh, adversarial sampling. And the bad news are that um, in this model, there is an attack that shows a separation from the static setting. It's not, it's not just that the previous analysis didn't work. There's actually a separation. And this is the attack. So, um, so the adversary maintains an interval, starting with the interval between 0 and 1. And in each round, it uh, sends the element in the middle of the interval, let's say. And checks to see whether the element was sampled or not. So let's say the first element was sampled. In this case, the interval will be the left, uh, the left half of uh, the current interval. So we'll take one, the interval between uh, 0 and 1 half. OK, now again, it sends the middle element of the current interval. Let's say this one was not uh, sampled. And in this case, the adversary chooses the right half of the current interval. So the one between one quarter and one half. Okay, and we, we go on and again, we, 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 we go to the right. Again, this was not sampled and so on. And this simple attack gives a sample that if you just look at the ordering of the elements, it's the most unrepresentative possible. All the sampled elements are bigger than all the non-sampled elements. This is not what we want from uh, the output of, of a median algorithm. And well, it was cer certainly a, a constant size sample uh, cannot, uh, cannot work against such an adversary. The good news, are, however, are that this attack in some sense requires unrealistic assumptions. It requires unrealistic bit complexity and if we have a universe of, of uh, u of uh, universe u, um, then the actual lower bound that we get is logarithmic in the size of u. So, in other words, if uh, if uh, we only have poly uh, polynomial in n uh, many elements in, in 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 the universe where we can pick elements, then this lower bound is uh, is just a constant. And the good news are that no substantially better attack exists. So uh, with Elon, we, we showed uh, an upper bound that also has this log of uh, the universe size and the usual, the usual suspects, the epsilon squared and the log one over delta. And the, in, let, let me just maybe give uh, very quick intuition of the proof. I don't really want to, to, to give the full proof, but just a quick intuition. So let's suppose the, the universe consists of two elements, zero and one. And the adversary wants that the fractions, so the, for the median to be inaccurate, we want, uh, or any, any quantile for this matter, we want the fraction of zeros in the stream to be much larger than, or, or much smaller than, than, than in the sample. And, but, but the problem is uh, that the fraction of zeros in the sample goes in some sense in the same direction as in the data. 
Um, so if you if the adversary uh, chooses to add an, a zero to this stream, then it slightly increases the uh, frequency of zeros in the stream. It can also uh, substantially increase the frequency of of, of uh, zeros in the sample. So like there are no there are no free there's there's no free lunch here. Anything that you do, uh, you lose somehow. Um, and this could be formalized. Um, um, so if we uh, denote by xi the number of zeros in the stream at time i and by si the number of zeros in the sample, um, and the discrepancy uh, between the, de the density of, of the number of zeros in the stream and the, uh, the, the number of zeros in the sample, uh, the frequency of samples in the stream and the frequency of samples in the, in the sample we denote it by yi, we would want in the end, the the, uh, the discrepancy to not be too large. We want to, to, to we want some analysis to, to show that. And these these uh, these random variables y i are not independent. So we can't use churn of bound or um, anything that that assumes uh, independence between the random variables. We could try to use martingales though. Um, but these random variables are not a, mar a martingale, um, where by martingale, as usual, I mean, I mean a, a series of, of, of random variables where the expected value of the next one of the i plus one variable is equal to the previous one. Um, so, okay, so I, I won't go into the full details, but there is a way to, to define a similar uh, uh, random variables that uh, do form a martingale. Um, okay, I won't go into into the detail too much, but it it it, it, it can be done, and um, and then okay, then, then we we run some uh, we we need to bound the variance, so, so it's just a matter of of doing some calculations, um, and uh, we use suitable uh, and a strong concentration and quality for martingales. Uh, to show that uh, indeed this this martingale converges, so in this in this simple setting, we are able to um, to show that the adversary can't really control the number of zeros in the sample. The number of zeros in the sample will, with very high probability, will be concentrated around. I mean, the the, the density of zeros in the sample will be with high probability concentrated around the density of zeros in the stream. Um, more generally, so uh, what what we are able to show is uh, uh, is uh, we, we can uh, formulate it in the language of, uh, of in the statistical language of, of a low of large numbers, where a low of large number with respect to to uh, to a family of events basically says that um, the probability of frequent of oh, in, in in our case maybe we should call it frequency of any event in the sample is similar to the frequency of this event in the stream. Um, okay, and and um, so for example, in the in the median example in in in, in the static proof that we've seen, uh, this family uh, of uh, two kind of events imply. If if these two events these two events uh, uh, happen that that we uh, described before if if they do happen then the median of the sample is an approximation of the median of the stream. Um, and the good news in general are that um, in fact we uh, for any uh, so so we have a uniform law of large numbers that works in the adversarial setting. Compared with the static setting, um, the dependence in the in the family of, of events is somewhat worse. It's logarithmic in, in the family instead of um, instead of uh, the VC dimension. And um, okay, and, and the next question is uh, whether there is uh, a combinatorial parameter that naturally captures. Um, uh, naturally captures the, the, the sample size 
in the same way that the VC dimension captures the static case. Compared with the static case where um, the VC dimension is, is the parameter that captures the, the, sample, the sample complexity plus the usual suspects of epsilon squared and, and the log of one over delta, in the adversarial setting, we get a result of VC dimension times some log of the universe size. Um, OK, and, and, and a question still remains of what is the right, right dependence. Um, but, be, but before trying to explain this in more detail, um, let me uh, just give you one application of, of this, um, of this uh, uh, positive results regarding uh, laws of large numbers. So in many geometric problems, you can define a family of events or family of, uh, uh, of ranges that uh, if we have a good approximation uh, of, of, our, of our data in each of these ranges, then we can, uh, we can perform some, uh, we can approximate interesting functions in, in the geometric regime. So for example, uh, uh, if you want to compute a center point, which is, which is a d-dimensional generalization of a median, then a uniform law of large numbers for half spaces in d dimensions suffices to approximate the center point. So if we just uh, uh, find the center point of the sample, it, it, it suffices to uh, approximate the center point for the whole stream of data. And uh, applying this theorem, for example, we get that it's enough in the adversarial setting to just look at d squared over epsilon roughly uh, samples in order to um, uh, so and and to compute the center point for them, and this will be a good enough approximation of the of the center point in uh, uh, in the full stream. So 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 one message of, of this result is that many problems in in in, in, in streaming. And it, it's actually it's, it's actually true also in the offline setting. So uh, um, it doesn't have to be a stream. But in many problems, you can downsample, and the objective function of uh, of the problem doesn't really change by much because the sample captures crucial properties that um, uh, that are sufficient for us to to just solve go on and solve the problem on the sample. Um, so, so the center point uh, example is just uh, one example of, of a high dimensional geometry problems. Uh, there the, the are other examples. But, um, um, so for example, range queries, or uh, uh, it could probably be relevant for clustering, although we, 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 didn't, uh, we didn't investigate it too much. But it seems that uh, uh, this is a way to capture a, High dimensional properties in an adversarial setting, just to downsample. Okay, and we, we are looking for a, a combinatorial parameter that uh, captures the adversarial sample size. Um, so, in the uh, offline setting uh, or in this, on the classical setting where um, uh, we don't have an, ad an adaptive adversary. The VC dimension is the right combinatorial parameter. And the, v the VC dimension of a family R of events is the largest cardinality, D, of a set uh, in the universe that is shattered by the events in the family. And what do I mean by shattered? It means that for any subset of S, there is as a, a, some a member of the family, so that the intersection between the set S and this member of the family is this subset. Okay, and we, we could. I, I'm not sure if the, if it's the if the if it's the easiest way to define this, but it's the most suitable way for for this talk. We could define it uh, using a tree. So uh, uh, the VC dimension is the maximum depth of a tree. So that where in the tree, uh, each node is labeled and nodes in the same height, in the same depths are, have the same label, where each pass 
in the tree corresponds in some sense to a, to, to a member of the family. So for example, um, uh, this pass, which indicates that X belongs to the, to the set, Y doesn't belong and, uh, and Z belongs, it corresponds to some, uh, to some, uh, to some uh, set R, so that R, the intersection of R and X, Y, Z is precisely X and Z. So R contains X and Z, doesn't contain Y, and we don't care about other, other elements. Okay, so this is one definition of, of VC dimension. You, it, it might be that you've seen in the past other definitions that don't uh, that look uh, don't, don't don't look at trees, but um, um, so this is a tree-based uh, definition. Um, and uh, what's nice about VC dimension is so, so there are many there are many important concepts in computational geometry, in uh, statistics, and, and and in and maybe most importantly in in, in pack learning that. Uh, Involve uh, the VC dimension, so so Puck learning uh, uh, a family R of hypothesis, uh, in fact, requires um, the VC dimension number of uh, samples plus the usual suspects, um, and this might look familiar to some of you because we, we've seen this ex exact expression some at some point in this presentation. Um, so this is, uh, we, we've seen that this is also the number of samples that is required for uh, the static case, for getting a uniform law of large numbers in the static case. Um, and, okay, so, so we, are, we are on the way to understanding what is the right combinatorial parameter um, for a, a, the adversarial case. And it turns out that the adversarial attack can, in some sense, be represented by a tree. But not a tree where labels in the same depths are equal. The, the labels have to be different uh, in each uh, node of the tree. And there is a definition that is closely related to VC dimension and looks exactly like this tree. This is the Littlestone dimension. So the Littlestone dimension is the same as the VC dimension, except that we allow labels on the same depths not to be equal. Um, and um, okay, and, and Littlestone dimension, uh, in fact, uh, uh, um, characterizes uh, online learning in many ways. For example, it, it captures regret in online learning. Um, so I won't go exactly into the uh, uh, model in online learning. It's it's slightly different than sampling. It's in in uh, if. Uh, if you, if you take, a, I mean, it's it's not clear why um, Little Stone, why, why our problem is should be exactly uh, like online learning, but it turns out that these two problems are characterized by uh, the same parameter and for good reason. Um, and okay, so let's so so we have some commutative diagram. We know that pack learning and static or classical uniform laws of large numbers are characterized by the VC dimension. And we know that online learning is characterized by Littlestone dimension. And it's tempting to, to conjecture that uh, getting an adversarial law of large numbers requires, uh, so it's characterized by the Littlestone dimension. And this is indeed the case. So we're able to get a bound uh, like in the static case, um, but with Littlestone instead of the VC dimension. So this is the right combinatorial parameter. And along the way, it actually um, uh, resolved some uh, central open problem in, 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 in online classification, in online learning uh, with uh, binary labels. Um, so it turns out that, um, uh, that uh, uh, the optimal regret, and I, I, I don't want to go into the definition, but the optimal regret bound in online learning, um, the class R with Littlestone dimension D is square root of a D times N, where N is the number of rounds. So the lower bound was known. It was, it was proved by Ben David uh, Pal and uh, Shader Schwartz. Um, and we proved the upper bound. In fact, uh, both uh, 
robust sampling and online learning are closely connected to a, a notion called the a sequential uh, Rademacher complexity, which is in itself related to uh, uh, an online, discrep online combinatorial discrepancy problem. And uh, this was uh, uh, this notion was uh, uh, defined by 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 uh, Rachlin by, by by Sasha Rachlin, which I think is here, and uh, Sridharan and uh, Tevari. And uh, th there's a follow-up work by by Sasha and uh, Adam Block and Yuval Dagan. Um, uh, that uh, in, that, that uh, extends this uh, uh, the discussion on uh, uh, the sequential Rademacher and shows that it's, it it doesn't apply only to a binary classification problem, but to more general real valued uh, learning problems. Um, okay, th that's all I had to say. Um, just to summarize, uh, there's a general effort uh, in the last one or two years to understand algorithms in adversarial environments. Uh, we, I, I would say we, we still lack a general theory. There are many, many uh, questions that we don't understand too well. Um, some, some existing algorithms do translate to the adversarial case, um, and so, some don't. We, we, we need measures to understand what works and what doesn't. Um, the, the certain, certainly, uh, the, the, the certainly a real world motivation for, for this problem because the, the online setting is, is very common. It's not clear whether the, this worst case adversarial setting is, is the most natural one, but that, that's another uh, uh, point that is interesting. What, what are the right models? So for example, reinforcement learning is, is one, one such model. Um, the game theoretic models, there are interesting questions. What, what are the right models here? And there are many connections to many other areas, such as, so as we've seen, uh, online learning statistics, combinatorics, privacy, and others.